I've been really paying attention to the relief in my body when I like have four tasks to do in a day instead of 10. Right. Um, or, and, and that is, that's not going to change actually once the, once the pandemic or the structure of the pandemic kind of shifts, if it does, because I do have a, I do have chronic illness and that's something I live with. This is Rebel Therapist, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are trained as therapists and who want to level up their businesses, make a bigger impact, feel fulfilled, and be very well paid. I'm your host, Annie Schusler. How do you move towards healing and liberation while creating the business of your dreams? I wanted to explore this question with someone who centers these values in their work. Asher Panjuris is a white, queer, non-binary psychotherapist, parent to a human and two rescue pups, group facilitator, and host of the Living in This Queer Body podcast. They live and work on stolen Nipmuc and Pocomtuck land. Welcome, Asher. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Annie. It's a real honor to be invited. Of course. So what I am imagining that I really want people to hear from you, and I'm going to, of course, ask you a bunch of questions to get us there, is I want them to see how you in your business have made a bunch of different moves and choices towards healing and liberation. And I mean like your own and your listeners and your participants. Like in our businesses, we are, in this country, we're always moving inside of this capitalist system. And especially in these micro-businesses, We're making these choices every day to move towards healing and towards liberation. So I would love to have people get just a sense, first of all, of what your business looks like. Well, I am... I am still a practicing psychotherapist, um, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And at this point... We are recording this during the pandemic. I am um, definitely pretty busy with my private practice, um, seeing patients. So I still do that um, pretty full time. But then I also have a podcast called Living in This Queer Body. And through that podcast project, which includes basically the podcast and um, a presence on Instagram, I have been sort of creating, generating community um, and connections with folks around the the kind of notion of barriers to embodiment, um, specifically in um, for queer body, queerly bodied people. And right now, I'm I'm running a um, an eight week long group called always coming home, which is a small group, uh, that focuses, it's a weekly group and, um, we're focusing on, um, barriers to nourishment. So, uh, the idea of, um, really being able to be in a space with queer identified people who, want to delve a little deeper into their relationship to nourishment regarding food, rest, um, and other forms of caring for the body. We're talking about how relationships to gender and sexuality, internalized ableism, um, internalized uh, fat phobia, um, internalized white supremacy, all of those things um, kind of impact our relationship to our bodies and how we can, I guess, achieve potentially more ease uh, ultimately. Um, So that group is, it's really powerful and it's it's a small group um, that I run, I'm going to run pretty regularly. So it's eight weeks and you're Mm -hmm. repeating it, like you're running it. Yeah, I will. I will repeat it. I, it, it's possible that this cohort will decide, you know, we really like each other and this is working. And I have 
allowed for it in my schedule that this could continue as an ongoing group. And part of the reason for that in partic- in this particular case is that it takes a long time. And this I've learned from offering workshops and, you know, one-off workshops or, or um, even my three month, this three month um, intensive that I, I run called embodied testimony. Um, it's, it takes a long time to uh, be able to, to kind of give voice to, or really get to um, talk with other people, even if you're like-minded, even if you really connect with them about, you know, how you feel about your, how, how food impacts how you feel about your sex life or lack thereof, or how your desire is connected to, you know, unhealed intergenerational trauma wounding, right? Like there's, there's so much that kind of, um, I feel like in some ways, the group often, this group in particular, often is sort of the repository for a lot of the topics that people haven't gotten to with their individual therapist or, you know, people don't talk about with their friends. Like they're kind of, there's a lot of shame and around, um, let's say, disordered eating behaviors um, and even things they don't talk about with their partners or their, you know, and so I think that the idea of the group is to kind of structure it in such a way that I provide some structure in the beginning to help draw people out and feel comfortable and establish a really safe container. But by the time eight weeks is up, we might uh, just be getting to the heart of some of these topics. Um, so we, I want that to be able to continue if, if necessary. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Can you- can you share s- an example of something that you might tend to do toward the beginning of a group to create that safety or that container? Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to be, um, I tend to maybe underestimate historically, I guess I've tended to underestimate how much care and attention and slowness is required to really allow people to feel safe talking with strangers about their bodies who knew right but i really I, and 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 i i think that i had a really uh I, i've had a lot quite an education about this based on my own experiences of living with chronic health issues and realizing not too long ago, actually, that I rarely ever, ever wanted to talk about that publicly or uh, frankly, socially or with my friends or, you know, that there was a, that was a real learning curve for me to address my own internalized ableism. Um, And, I think that that has helped me to kind of um, soften things in the beginning in terms of like possible pain points and really creating um, like group agreements, right? Like we agree to these things and I outline some things, but then the group adds to that, right? So forms of listening that feel good. Are there any things that people, you know, need to know or understand about your history going, start even beginning this process? Um, And then I also end up doing a lot more like guided work at the beginning. So I, I have assignments in between each session and they're optional, but they're, you know, they're usually like a journal prompt that pushes, pushes the topics a little further. And sometimes people can kind of discover things on their own um, and then bring them to the group. And I rely a bit more on like breakout rooms um, because everything is Zoom these days, but I, you know, I rely a bit more on, on breakout rooms, even though it's a small group, like even, you know, getting people even into smaller groups discussions. So I think it takes a while for a group to coalesce. And yet it's also extremely powerful to, I think just from the get go to 
notice or to hear about so many um, kind of like subterranean points of ref, like reference and resonance that other people um, that often we feel very alone with. Um, so you hear group members kind of describing their relationship to food or eating and it really resonates and you kind of, you know, it's sometimes really revel revelatory. Um, so I think there's, there's a bit more of me in the beginning. <laughs> um, me being proactive kind of make, yeah, me being proactive, I guess, in the beginning. What do you find in, so we're talking about this group that has a chance to go pretty deep and then maybe even gets to go deeper after the eight weeks. And you were just mentioning like it's different in something like a one-off, a workshop. Yeah. And yet like your podcast and, and some of your work, you are really good at getting people <laughs> into something pretty transformative, pretty fast. Like, what do you find is the difference? Like what's possible in a workshop as opposed to in something longer? I think, I mean, I'm still learning about that myself. It's, it's because I think, you know, when you mentioned the podcast, I don't, I, uh, I don't set out, you know, when I'm going to interview someone, I don't set out uh, with an agenda to like, you know, make this person talk about something really, I don't, I can't, I can't think of an example, but, um, but I think there's something about my background as a therapist that, that does, I guess, translate into an ability that I'm not always even aware of an ability to hold space for a lot of distress, a lot of complexity, a lot of nuance, right? And I'm attentive to nuance um, in emotional experiences. And so I think that's part of it is just that I, and that's, you know, I've taken your course and I know that that's maybe, as you would say, one of my superpowers. It's also, I think, something that in the case of this longer term group, I really have to be attentive um, to my pacing, right? And that I ultimately never want to um, say, okay, today, I might say something like this, you know, today we are going to talk about sex, <laughs> you know, we've been talking about our bodies. Uh, and now we're going to talk about sex today. And that I can tell, right? Like there are a lot of people in the group that want to talk about it, need to talk about it need to talk about their avoidance of it, need to, you know, whatever it is. And yet there is a sort of like aversion to the possible discomfort that might come up um, in that conversation. Um, and so I do, I guess I am kind of a combination of like provocative and trying to be very considerate and spacious and attentive to, uh, to triggers, to indications that someone is, is experiencing a bit too much, um, which is harder, you know, uh, comparing that to sort of a workshop that's attended by a larger group of people. It's much harder. I can't, I can't control that, uh, that nuanced attention quite as much or like a webinar. I'm going to do a webinar soon. And that's a very different, you know, um, format. Mm -hmm. And in there, I guess I'm just thinking for the participant, their expectation may be part of what makes it so different. Their expectation of like, I'm going to be there for this hour or for this 90 minutes or whatever it is. And then I'm going to be out. And there's a way that that's not as safe. And then there's a way that's so much safer. <laughs> exactly. Yes, you're right. Yeah. It's both. And yeah. And I think, I think that it's, it is up to, and I obviously, you know, that's, I try to be very transparent about what I'm offering, if that makes sense, you know, like what you're signing up for with the languaging um, that I use uh, so that people can kind of um, self-select, you know, like how they want to work with me in that regard. Yeah. How are you taking care of yourself and your own body and spirit as you're offering these things, do you find that that these offerings contribute to your own healing, or do you find sometimes that they 
take something out of you or kind of some combination of all of that? Mm -hmm. It's a very um, appropriately timed question because we're, you know, we're deep in pandemic life. Um, I have a child, I'm a parent, I'm also a parent to two dogs, but I'm, you know, I'm balancing a lot and a lot more than I, than any of us really anticipated my patients included. And so I think there's a bit of a, a bit of a rocky moment right now where the uh, level of intensity of my private practice, which I still, you know, as I said, I still have a pr- relatively full private practice or it's certainly full, but it's, it's, um, it's maybe not full time by some people's standards, but um, I, I, I have certainly um, am working a lot with, with my patients during this time. Um, I think that, that I, in an optimal setting, you know, the podcast definitely um, feels nourishing to me. Um, I'm mostly really lucky because I get to have conversations with people I I actually just really want to talk to. I rarely have interviewed people that I know very well at all or if at all. So um, the it's it's like it really is like a new it's an opportunity for me to to talk to people that I don't know and um and who I think are interesting and compelling. Um, so that's usually very nourishing and like very, um, kind of makes me just feel really, really glad about the energy I'm putting into it because it goes out into the world and other people get to connect with my interviewee. And, you know, I mean, it, it's a kind of a very overall, just like a really generative experience. I think sometimes the group's I think for the most part, the groups and workshops that I offer are are also really require something slightly different from me than my my psychotherapy practice, and and they are in that way like an opportunity for me to be more creative, even just in imagining what's possible. Like I can, I mean, I can't guarantee anyone's going to come, but I can, you know, like generate the possibility of a workshop or a, you know, a group and, and then see what happens. And it feels like there are less constraints um, than in my um, psychotherapy practice in certain ways. So when things are operating optimally, which, you know, who knows when that's ever happening, but, you know, in theory, I, I do feel like I've, I kind of pre pandemic, I definitely reached a point where I felt as if I was, kind of striking a balance around like this, this, my living in this square body project and the offerings associated with it were really like an opportunity for me to flex some parts of myself that I don't always get to. And, and I think part of that is because I'm not, you know, this is the dilemma. I'm not reliant on the income, um, because I still have a private practice. And so I'm in this, you know, I, I haven't yet taken like a, a significant leap um, in terms of relying on, you know, I don't make any money on my podcast, but I, I make some money through the podcast in the sense that people find out about what I'm offering. But I think that's part of it is, is I really can be creative with my ideas and push the boundaries of things a bit more. And that's, it's fun to see kind of where it lands for people. We're going to get right back to Asher. First, do you want my help expanding into a business beyond private practice? If you're a therapist and or a healer, I made create your program for you with my support and the support of a small group you'll create a pilot program that harnesses your gifts. Perhaps you'll create a group, a course, a retreat, a coaching program, or something else that you dream into. We work together over five weeks. Go to rebeltherapist.me slash create to learn more and apply. I can't wait to meet you. Okay, let's get back to Asher. 
Yeah, it feels like, I know I mentioned this to you before, it definitely feels like a work of art, like a an evolving work of art, like where you've got, you know, new installations happening all the time with new guests and just everything from the music to the way, the pacing, everything about it to even the the visuals that go along with it. It feels like an art piece. And yeah, I'm wondering if that, I guess I'm hearing that that is healing in a, in some kind of way or generative in some kind of way for you to be engaged in that. Definitely. I mean, I, it's so, it's so kind of you to, to kind of say that. And I, but it, it is, you know, I, I didn't think I was going to become a therapist. I went to graduate school at the Art Institute of Chicago um, and I studied visual art and made videos and studied art theory. And um, I really, I was really compelled by kind of like alternative forms of documentary film and in a strange and very kind of curious way, I made my way in some ways through this podcast project back to a part of myself that I think got lost along the way in terms of like professionalizing myself as a clinical social worker and, you know, taking the right tests and getting the right certifications. And um, yeah, definitely there's a part of myself that I feel, and it's allowed me, I think, because that part of myself is back, I, I, um, it's allowed me to integrate a lot more of my kind of own personal journey and the, again, the, like the feeling of I'm a, it's tricky because I do still have a, a private practice. I, there is a, a limit of what I do, you know, reveal about my life. But but I think I do really s- allow myself to talk like about what my body feels like and about what what my body journey has been like. And that's not something that that's something that really feels good to do in conversation with other people, like in in community, right? Um, and so, yeah, it feels like a really it feels like a really good format for me. Mm. And it's just occurring to me, like, and I can relate to this with this podcast, that it's really a very collective kind of project. Mm-hmm. It's always yeah. bringing in other voices. Yes, for sure. Sh- yes, definitely. It's, it's, um, it feels, I just interviewed um, this amazing person, Colin Hagendorf, um, recently for the the podcast and um she's a trans person who is really like was really influenced by the punk scene and um making zines and also has uh her own podcast and um i think what was so cool about it, connecting with colin was like our shared um our shared history of um, like loving reading zines, making zines um, and that we both kind of do come from that like queer punk uh, background where, you know, assembling a bunch of stories and voices in a, in, you know, and then going to like Kinko's and making copies and disseminating them like that feeling of, um, really valuing storytelling as a way of um, as one part of kind of this effort towards collective liberation was, was, is really a shared value for us. And in some ways, when I think about the podcast, it's kind of like, you know, an audio and visual zine. God, it really is that, Everything you just said and Kinko's, Jesus, you took me, you're like right back to the nineties in the best way. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I mean, this is, yeah, there's some, and people are still making zines. And in fact, I have, I will have to say this, my, the people in my embodied testimony three month program intensive that I did, uh, um, several months ago and it, and all three months of that happened during the 
the beginning of the pandemic. So it was quite a ride to take with, um, there's probably like 20 people in the group and they just, um, came out with a, a zine, like a, a, a real, uh, I mean, it's, it's digital right now, but it's going to be in print and reflecting on our experience together. And I, of course, you know, planted the seed. I was like, you know, we could make something here, you know, how about a zine? But it, it resonated with <laughs> quite a few of the people. Um, and they took it upon themselves and they made it. And I, I mean, I, it was, it made me cry. I was so pleased because I think that they, you know, they were able to share parts of their experience with that very intensive um, group uh, in that format was really, yeah, it's really cool. That's amazing. That's making me think of like the way in terms of liberation and healing, the way that you hold your leadership in, in your business and in your projects that like there's a tension I feel like in being a leader, there's always a tension in holding the responsibility of the leadership and being willing, like how, how Priya Parker, who wrote The Art of Gathering, talks about like being willing to take on the hard parts of leadership to protect the group and always moving in the direction of giving people as much power as possible, like all at the same time. I don't even know if I have a question about that. I just hear, hear that in, um, in the way that you talk about. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah. It's interesting. I haven't thought about it in that exact context, but yeah, that, that tension is, is very real, especially in, in, I think I feel it in, in terms of responsibility. Um, like if I'm, if I'm going to be hosting a workshop or something, a webinar a group, um, or interviewing someone, I'm very aware. And this is, you know, thanks to my clinical training as a therapist really is I, I'm acutely aware of as much as I can, you know, surely there are things that escape my, my consciousness, but, you know, I'm very aware of, of the power that I hold if I'm holding space <laughs> um, and also the power of what happens between myself and another individual or a group. You know, I think a lot about Jessica Benjamin's idea of like a third space, you know, like the space between like what happens when two people or um, a group of people get together and we, we generate something something else altogether, a third space. And I think that that that's something that I'm really interested in. And each, each offering that I have each, uh, kind of different format that, um, I create does, I think, generate some kind of third space, even, you know, even the podcast interviews, there's, there are discussions and conversations that emerge from that, that I'm not even a part of, you know? Um, and, I, I love that, you know, I love that that happens. Absolutely. When people sign up for your programs, for your workshops, all those kinds of things, are they finding you through your podcast? Um, I think yes, they're finding me through the podcast and through Instagram, um, and word of mouth and newsletter, my newsletter. I mean, I think it's, it's those things, um, it's like that whole ecosystem. It is. I mean, I've definitely, I will say I've, I, I think it, it, there's a decent amount of overlap too, in terms of my work as a, my work and identity as a psychotherapist. I do have a lot of people that find me in part because there are, there aren't very many queer identified people who work in, um, the eating disorder field, which is, um, part of what I do. It's not all of what I do, but it's, um, I think sometimes people find me, um, and feel very relieved before they even start working with me, just that like I exist and I am willing to, um, operate within that like sort of field, um, which it, it you know, it shouldn't be the case. Like there should be more, um, 
and there are, of course, I'm not the only one, but I'm just saying there, there's a, a very strong need for more um, people, especially to work with like the trans community and around disordered eating. And so I think there's, there is some overlap in that regard as well, just people kind of searching and finding and being referred. But I would say, yeah, I mean, the, the podcast, uh, yeah, definitely generates some, um, some interest. It's, I don't, I, you know, because I'm not, again, because I'm not entirely reliant on, the income, I think I'm not quite at the stage where I'm fully tracking um, all of that as, you know, as kind of persistently as I could. But um, there's a lot of return customers as well. Like I get to know people that, you know, they'll do two workshops with me and then they'll do a program intensive or something like that, which I know is, is kind of um, happens for you as well. Um, And that's really lovely for me. Absolutely. And, you know, in terms of the tracking thing, I will say, like, you know, I'm a major geek about that stuff. Yeah. But <laughs> I don't always, I used to track more things than I do now because I realized I was tracking things and then not doing anything with that information. So I just want to say, like, sometimes it's great. And, like, it's not always, I track less things than I used to. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, for example, you're not going to stop doing your podcast either way. Like you, you know, or if you do, it's not going to be, it's going to be because you want to, like, it's a, yes. obviously like a, a creation that comes from such a deep place. I think that's a good point. Yeah. That there are certain things that <clears throat> I would, I certainly would stop doing, you know, I mean, I have a limited amount of energy. And so that, you know, I think that calculus is, is in there for me. And in the sense that the podcast feels like something I want to keep generating, I don't attend to how many people are listening to it or anything like that. Um, And I like that, Um, that works for me. That works for me, I think that to kind of keep it away from like revenue generating, um, it feels like it frees something up, but you know, there is, there is some, I guess, more, more thinking involved when it comes to other offerings because I have, you know, limited energy and protect my energy. So, but yeah, it's a good point that to, I hadn't actually thought about it that way, but it's a good point that I would, I would totally be doing the podcast irregardless of, you know, the numbers or whatever that is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So on your podcast, you've interviewed people like Adrienne Marie Brown and Jenna Wortham. And I'm wondering how you approach them. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, you know, I mean, part of it is that I have, um, I try to, I guess, curate and make sure that within my Instagram and I'm kind of, you know, I have some feelings and thoughts about how reliant I am and other people are on Instagram, but it, you know, it is what it is right now. Um, I feel like I've, I really want as much as I can for that space to speak to my values. Um, and, And so that's part of it, I think. Um, And that like, I feel comfortable, you know, approaching people whose work I really admire. Um, And knowing that I have a body of work that's imperfect and, you know, complicated, but it is, you know, I do feel like I have, I'm always trying to live in work in integrity. around my values. And so I just, I just asked them, you know what I mean? I, I just asked them and, you know, some people depends who you're asking have, you know, managers or agents and you go through them. And sometimes people approach me, um, to appear on my podcast. But I think that that kind of part about integrity feels really important that, 
Um, oftentimes I'll send, you know, if I, if I'm really like, oh my God, this person is amazing. Like I'll send them, you know, one of the episodes that of the podcast and, you know, that's kind of a representation of, of what we would potentially be doing together. Are you interested? Right. Um, and it's nice to feel, you know, really feel good about what I'm putting out there. And that matters to me a lot. Um, and I, it matters to me the, the kind of the values that are conveyed, um, in my work. Yeah. Both like, you know, kind of when I say values, I mean, you know, like ethically, morally, but also, you know, very much politically. And I hope that, and feel very honored that, you know, my space, the space I created as a white person is even, uh, feels accessible for really powerful um, thinkers and creators like Adrienne Marie Brown and Jenna Wortham, right? You know, that I, um, I feel really honored about that and feel like I, as a white person, have a lot more work to do in terms of continuing to ensure that the spaces that I hold are, are accessible um, and and safe Um, people who a lot of people know are important. And like, that isn't the, that isn't necessarily why you're asking them. Like they fit into the story that you're trying to tell. Like they, they bring, they bring what you are hoping to bring to your listeners. I just asked someone um, to be on this podcast recently who I had that feeling of like, well, a lot of people know this person's important and, um, and, The way I worded it, and I couldn't believe they said yes, I'm really excited. But I was like, well, when I was wording it, I said, my listeners will really make the most of the gifts that you have to give us. And I felt like that was so true. I felt like this is, um, yeah, they really want to hear from you and they're going to listen carefully. And I felt like, well, that's, it's okay if they say no, it's okay if they say yes, but um, I can promise what I can promise. So Jenna Wortham and Adrienne Marie Brown, both are people that are deeply invested in interrogating um, challenges to embodiment um, and uh, like questioning what brings a body pleasure and ease and why that's so difficult and what are, what are the barriers to that and how can we do that? And they're both, you know, kind of separately, you know, politically aligned in ways that I really value. And so the, the languaging of, of, you know, knowing that my audience (laughs) is probably really attuned to the subtleties around their, their willingness to share their stories uh, around their own bodies. Um, and they're, yeah, that's what my audience is desperately wanting to hear, you know, is how do you navigate these things that feel so impossible sometimes like food and nourishment and rest and pleasure and safety in your body. In terms of your own nourishment, is there anything that, you could share with us about something that's been working for you, perhaps during this time that is helping you to nourish your body, nourish your spirit. Mm, Sure. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, now more than ever, um, I have been allowing myself to rest. And by rest, I don't necessarily mean like nap or sleep, but I do do that. Um, but I think for me, rest as someone who can like really multitask and I'm a Virgo and I, you know, I can, it's a pandemic, but there's a lot to do. And, you know, like, so I can go there, but I also think that the nature of this time has, and this is very much like influenced by years of engagement and ongoing engagement with kind of with disability justice literature that really I've been interrogating my own just more and more interrogating my own internalized ableism and expectations of myself and really it's been illuminated during this pandemic 
the extent to which I override constantly my body's needs and the the kind of structure of the pandemic is such that like there are certain things that I can't force myself to do because they're you know I just can't and yet I've been really paying attention to the relief in my body when I like have four tasks to do in a day instead of 10, right? Um, or, and, and that is, that's not going to change actually once the, once the pandemic or the structure of the pandemic kind of shifts, if it does, because I do have a, I do have chronic illness and that's something I live with. And so I think it's the overriding piece that really I've been taking more notice of. And I, because time has shifted and slowed down in certain ways, I can be a little bit more intentional about how I'm structuring my time. But it's also illuminated how much, I don't know, like self maintenance really, I really like, you know require and benefit from, you know, if I can read a book, you know, just, I love reading fiction and and nonfiction too, but I love like, I have the most amazing, very safe library system. I live in Amherst, Massachusetts now, and they have the most amazing, safe, like just unbelievable, very communicative. I mean, it's a small town, so it's easy for this to happen, but I've just been getting like going to the library and getting my books, you know, and that process has felt so nurturing to me to kind of like have the spaciousness to read. So thank you, Jones Library. And also that that's, I would say that's one thing that really is, and baths, you know, more baths always for me. Mm. Oh, thank you. That's so helpful. <laughs> we we don't have our cameras on, but you would have seen me just like rocking and like, <laughs> With my eyes closed and nodding. Like, <laughs> yeah. just back and, like, <laughs> yes. So what are you excited about in like the rest of 2021 and going forward? Mm. <sighs> Deep sigh for the times that we're living in. There's, I think there's a couple things that come to mind. The first thing that came to mind when you said that, what am I excited about is a sort of a double-edged answer in the sense that the thing I'm excited about is mutual aid and that has always existed, but the, the level of mutual aid efforts and the kind of m- the prevalence of really thinking about our collect, how collectively intertwined we are is almost inescapable. I suppose some people really still can't quite, understand that even in this time. But for the most part, that's something that's really exciting to me is sort of this renewed sense of our interdependence and, um, and the need to really care for the collective. Um, And we're doing that by wearing masks or we're doing that in all sorts of ways every day, but it's like way, it's, it's very um, close to consciousness for a lot more people now. And I'm, I'm excited about that um, because that's something that matters to me um, deeply. And so that's one thing I'm excited about. Um, I'm, I'm also, I'm excited about the way that the podcast, like, honestly, I'm excited about just the idea that I'm gonna, I don't know, have 50 episodes soon and that it feels like something I want to keep doing long term. Like it it really does feel like a very something I'm proud of and uh something that needs to keep happening. And it, there are always lots of ideas that I have about bringing more people in or, you know, hosting conversations. Like I would really like to start getting into that where I am more of a facilitator of a conversation between two people or three people um, and finding different formats for that to happen. And I don't know, maybe I guess there's a possibility of some kind of like, maybe it's going to be a zine, maybe it's going to be a book. I don't know, but something, um, something that, that is more of a visual representation of some of the work that um, has been going on with, with living in this queer body is, is on the horizon uh, in some way. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. Thank you for all of that. And thank you so much for being here and having this conversation with us. Oh, thank you so much, Annie. I would not, I actually wouldn't have a podcast if it weren't for you. Your program truly like really helped illuminate why that might be a great thing for me to try out. So I thank you for that. Oh, thank you. You're going to make me cry. I did it's not true. ask them to it's say so that. True. I'm not even doing a plug. There's no, <laughs> it's not even that. It's just, it's really true. I mm. really needed that encouragement. Um, and it just the encouragement to kind of continue breaking from convention, um, which is what I seem to really do quite well. Um, but I, I appreciate your, um, your encouragement in that regard. Now I'll loop back to share some takeaways that particularly stand out to me. Takeaway number one, Asher creates safety in their programs by providing more guidance and more of themselves in the beginning to help the group get safe and coalesce. They also use breakout rooms into even smaller groups to build that safety. You know, I rely a bit more on on breakout rooms, even though it's a small group, like even, you know, getting people even into smaller group discussions. Takeaway number two, Asher's podcast and email newsletter and Instagram feed, really the whole living in this queer body ecosystem is a creative act of service and really an act of love. And along with word of mouth, it's how people find their paid programs. They're finding me through the podcast and through Instagram and word of mouth and newsletter. My newsletter. I mean, I think it's, it's those things. Takeaway number three. Asher has been in a process of doing less and finding more rest. And in that process has been grappling with their own internalized programming and their tendency to override their body's needs. I've been paying a lot of attention to this in myself ever since my conversation with Asher. I've been interrogating my own, just more and more interrogating my own internalized ableism and expectations of myself and really it's been illuminated during this pandemic, the extent to which I override constantly my body's needs. Those are three of my takeaways. What stood out to you? Send me an email at info at coachingwithannie.com. Even better, include a voice memo so I can share your voice on the pod. Tell me what stood out to you from this conversation and what it's helping you rethink in your own business. You can find out more about Asher at livinginthisqueerbody.com. I want to thank Cosmo Palms for editing this podcast. If you found our conversation supportive, please share it with your favorite therapist or healer. That's how we reach more people. And you've gotten us over the hump to over 100 ratings on Apple Podcasts. That makes us feel kind of fancy. And why do I even care? because those numbers tell the system to put Rebel Therapist in front of more people. So it really makes a difference. So if you haven't already, please take a minute and give us a five-star rating. And if you want to give us a review and mention how awesome Asher is, please do. More people will find this conversation. And most of all, thank you so much for listening. I will see you next time.